let's look at a hypothesis test for comparing means of two paired samples. At the Winter Olympics, speed skaters compete in pairs. One starts in the inner lane, one starts in the outer lane, and halfway through, they switch. Is there an advantage to starting in a particular lane? Here are the speed skating times for the inner lane and for the outer lane in the 1500 meter women's race at the 2006 Winter Olympics in Torino, that is Turin, Italy. This is the inner lane, this is the outer lane. We're going to ignore the first one, Daniela Oltean, because she had no competitor, so we're not going to pay attention to her. Can we do a hypothesis test to compare the means of two independent groups? Do the data satisfy the required conditions? Well, we need independent groups. Each subject from one group is not matched with or related to a subject from the other group. We don't have that. Each subject from one group is matched with someone from the other group. Well, can we do a hypothesis test to compare the means of paired samples? Do the data satisfy the required conditions? Here they are. You need paired data. The data must consist of matched pairs, like before and after for the same individual, or left and right ears for the same individual, something along those lines. Or, in this case, skater in the left lane, skater in the right lane, inner lane and outer lane. Differences are independent. None of the differences affect the other differences. In other words, what happens in one race, the difference in one race, does not affect the difference in another race. There's a random sample from each population, or people are randomly, uh, randomly assigned to each group. We've got that. Distribution of the differences is nearly normal. Uh, when the number of pairs is less than or equal to 15, got a data have to, the differences have to look like that. When the number of pairs is between 15 and 40, the differences have to be distributed by, like that. And when the number of pairs is greater than or equal to 40, uh, the differences just can't be extremely skewed. Find the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, the null hypothesis is that there is no difference, and it has an equal sign. It's mu sub d equals zero. In other words, the mean of the differences is zero. The alternative hypothesis is that it does make a difference. And in this case, the alternative hypothesis, well, it's got one of those signs in it, so it'll be of this form. Mu sub d is either not equal to zero, greater than zero, less than zero. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference between skating in the inner lane and skating in the outer lane. So the way we can represent that mathematically is let d equal the difference between inner lane skating and outer lane skating time, inner minus outer. Well, the null hypothesis is that mu sub d equals zero. We choose this as the alternative hypothesis because we want to test the hypothesis that there is no difference between skating in the inner lane and skating in the outer lane. We're not testing the hypothesis that inner is better than outer, or vice versa. Okay, this is our null and alternative hypothesis. Calculate the test statistic. Here n is the number of pairs. So we've got the sample mean, sample standard deviation, square root of n. By the way, the denominator of the test statistic, all of this stuff, is called the standard error of the mean. The book represents it by SE or SE of D bar. Okay, the easiest way to find the sample mean of the differences or the sample standard deviation of the differences is to let the calculator or the computer do the work. So we're gonna press, I'll tell you this and then I'll show you it. We press stat and then edit, enter the inner times in L1, the outer times in L2, go to the top of L3 and enter L1 minus L2 at the top of L3. Press enter have the differences in L3. Press quit, and then press stat, calc, one variable stats, followed by L3 on the same line to find D bar and S sub D. Got it? Just kidding. Okay, so here's what it looks like. These are the times in the inner lane and the outer lane. We're going to ignore this first one. Okay, so I've already taken, I've already taken time to enter these. You go, to, you go to stat, and then edit, enter, and you just enter these in the first list, L1, enter these in the second list, L2, and then check out what happens when we go to L3. Well, actually, L3 shouldn't have anything in it originally, so if L3 does have stuff in it, you can just press clear and then enter. Okay, so here we've got L3. L3 is going to be L1, so that's second one, minus L2, that's second L2, and then press enter. Whoops, sorry. Uh, L1 minus L2.
I've already entered the data. I wanted to spare you that. So we press stat, edit, and then here's the data. Here are the data in L1 and L2. You can just enter those. And then here's the cool thing. You go to L3, go to the top, and at the very top, we put L1, which is second one, minus second two, which is minus L2, press enter. Oh, isn't that cool? So this tells us L1 minus L2. The calculator can calculate the differences like that. Okay, now if we want to find the mean of the differences and the standard deviation of the differences, here's what we do. We quit, and then we go to stat, and then calc, one variable statistics. And we want to specify that we want to work with L3. So second, L, second three, that's L3. And this tells us the sample mean and the sample standard deviation for L3. The sample mean is 0.4988. Sample standard deviation is S sub X, that's 2.333, etc. Very cool. Okay. So there's the sample mean, sample standard deviation, n equals 17. Plug all of that in, and we get t equals 0.8819. Use the test statistic to determine whether we should reject or fail to reject a to zero. Okay, you know how to find the t distribution table. You go to back of the book, and you open it, or you can enter t distribution table into a search engine, and you get something that looks like this. Now the column we want, we have a two-tail test, so we want two-tail probability, and we've got 0.05, so uh, we want this middle column. And the row, well, the degrees of freedom for this test, the paired samples, is the number of pairs minus 1. That's 17 minus 1, which is 16. So at row 16, which means 2.120, that's going to be our value of T star. Okay, if our eternal hypothesis looks like this, the rejection region is going to look like that. This is our alternative hypothesis. Since our alternative hypothesis is two-sided of that form, we reject the null hypothesis if t is less than negative t star or t is greater than t star, just like we saw a moment ago. Okay, from the table, we saw the t star is 2.120, so we reject if t is less than negative t star, in other words, negative 2.120, or if t is greater than t star, in other words, t is greater than 2.120, and t is 0.8819. So neither satisfies this nor this, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Use a graphing calculator to determine whether we should reject or fail to reject H0. Oh, this is cool. This is, makes it so easy. So we press stat, test, t-test. Your input can be data, if you already have typed all the raw data into the TI, or it can be stats, if you know the basic stats already. Since our input is coming from data, choose data and enter L3 next to it second and then three because our data uh, are in list L3. So check this out. Okay, we turn the TI on, press stat, tests. Uh, this is a T test. Okay, now we want data. So we want data and then enter. Uh, so we want, let's see, yeah, mu sub D, that's our difference, it's zero. The list we want is L3. Check this out. Second, three, list is L3. Sorry, uh, second and then three, L3. Okay, that looks fine, frequency. Uh, yeah, that's our alternative hypothesis, and then calculate. Okay, bam, we've got it. There's our T value. There's our P value. Well, this is our T statistic, that's our P value. Oh man, that P is so big. If the P is low, then all must go. This P is big, so we do not reject the null hypothesis. There, wasn't that easy? That was very cool. Okay, the p-value is 0 0.3909. Since the p is greater than p-value is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And when our p-value is much greater than 0 0.05, we say there's not sufficient evidence to conclude that the alternative hypothesis is true. So we say there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that there's a difference between skating in the inner lane and skating in the outer lane. Use a graphing calculator to find a 95% confidence interval for the difference between inner lane skating time and outer lane skating time, that is inner minus outer. So choose stat, test, t interval, and press enter. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so again, stat, tests, t interval, and enter. Uh, input is data. Yeah, the input is data. List is L3. Confidence level 0.95. That's what we want. Calculate. 
Okay, bam, there it is. So there's our T interval. There's our confidence interval. Very cool. So that's on the next slide. So a 95% confidence interval for the difference between inner lane skating time and outer lane skating time is 0 0.70, negative 0 0.7009, uh, 1.6986. Very painless. Give a proper interpretation of the 95% confidence interval. Well, if the null hypothesis is true, there is a 95% chance that the difference between the inner lane skating time and the outer lane skating time lies in this interval. Note that zero is in the 95% confidence interval. Consequently, what is our conclusion about the null hypothesis? Well, because zero is in the 95% confidence interval, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The difference might be zero. There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a difference. And that concurs with what we saw earlier. By the way, the earliest ice skating happened in southern Finland more than 3,000 years ago, according to Wikipedia, the fount of all knowledge. Originally, skates were merely sharpened, flattened bones strapped to the bottom of the foot. Skaters did not actually glide on the ice, but rather glided on top of it. So they didn't skate on the ice, they just glided on top of it. True skating emerged when a steel blade with sharpened edges was used. Skates now cut into the ice instead of gliding on top of it. Adding edges to ice skates was invented by the Dutch in the 13th or 14th century.